Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Gloria McMillan. She has a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature, as well as a Master of Arts in English Literature and Comparative Literature. She has a PhD in Rhetoric, Composition, and Teaching English. Her dissertation, From Spoken Of to Speakers, on the Chicago Immigrant Women Writers from 1890 to 1940. This was um, associated with Jane Addams' history. And she's currently a research associate at the Department of English at the University of Arizona. Her recent edited work, The Rutledge Companion to Literature in Class. And now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Gloria. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I'm so honored to be asked to come back. I enjoyed your group four. So um, I can start my first slide if you wish. Do you want me to do that? Okay. So I'll get into the real one, not the one with all this stuff. Okay. Well, uh, Jane Adams, we're revisiting Jane from our last uh, Chicago Jane. Now we're working between Chicago Jane, and that was in March, by the way. If you want to go to the Jane Adams branch uh, YouTube page, YouTube channel, you can see that. So Jane has now moved from her Chicago roots, being born in Cedarville and going to the Rockford Women's Seminary, which is now Rockford College. And she made her year in, in England and Europe, toured Europe, and found Toynbee Hall. And that inspired her to create the next slide, if I can get down to it. Let me just look for the next slide here. Not forwarding my slides for some reason. Um, I, will, I will have to, I think by clicking it there. Okay, I have to use my mouse. Um, she went to Chicago and founded the Hull House Settlement, which wasn't, unlike what most people think, mainly to give out food and, and it wasn't a soup kitchen. A lot of people think that in a, in a clothing pantry. That wasn't what it was. It was to create a community that crossed class lines. And we have them today. We have race and class lines. So that's what she was aiming at. And that was what was going on at Toynbee Hall. So the arts were very important. And one of the big performance, uh, stage performances they gave at the Hull House Theater, which was a fully stocked, fully staged theater with curtains and uh, wings and everything, was the Trojan Women by Euripides. And so I have a little question there. What, what is done to women in war? And I think most of us can answer that, the civilian women, that is. So Jane Addams built her knowledge of war and peace from what was going on in all the ethnicities in, around Hull House in the neighborhoods. She worked heavily with the Greeks and, and wanted to help them to be seen as other than um, immigrants with accents and funny, funny names. So she was bringing their culture along with what she got out of Trojan women, which is the eternal problem of women being raped in war. So she had, she funded a 1915 tour just around the time she went to The Hague and it toured the country. It was uh, the Trojan women. And this is one of the, I think from El Paso, uh, a newspaper writing about it. And it's supposed to show the futility of war and it has a great dignified uh, epic structure but it shows the futility and horrors of what happens to women in war. So if you look at the center text in this newspaper, you see they're, they're linking it to blighted Belgium, which could go either way. It's a two-edged sword. Some people were thinking of the horrors of war and others had that urge to go help, give them, give them weapons, give them more weapons, help them to fight. This is an, a recurring theme but her intention with the Trojan women was not that, it was to uh, show the futility of war. In the pre-World War I situation, uh, people were, German was very inter 
integrated into the whole culture of the United States. And I won't read you everything that's there. I'll just assume you can. And if some of these slides have too much text, you can hit print screen and then just control V and paste it either into, uh, well, into Word. You can paste these pictures. So if you see something you really want, it has a link in it and a lot of text, just hit control, uh, hit print screen up at the top and then control V. Okay, so you read this and then what changed very quickly was when the war fever rhetoric came in, it really changed US culture. And you can see it dropped people learning the language, German language, and, and this is for any language other than English, they go up and down depending what's going on in the world. So German had been very prevalent all over the country and then only 1% were teaching it because as it says there, it, it will taint you somehow if you learn German, you'll become a Hun, you'll become a totalitarian. So um, then also we had other elements of culture that changed. This, um, sheet music on the left hand side hang him on the sour apple tree was really a, a nice little ditty from the minstrel show days of the 1880s or 1890s about lynching how to make lynching popular so um someone who wrote very charming music his other song was ella ree was uh wrote this and soon it was adapted it was adapted first hanging jeff davis during the Civil War and then around the time of World War I, hanging the Kaiser and all to the same tune. And I'm sure during World War II, we hung Hitler too to the same tune. But it's about lynching. That's something to keep in mind. Here we see one of the stories uh, that showed what Jane Addams was up to when she was in Europe. And notice that they speak about the spirit of hate. You don't hear that in our news today. They're honest. What they're saying is that hate is rampant all over Europe, hate from one side to the other. And now we don't even mention that. We assume that the other side hates. We don't hate. We may send missiles, but we don't hate. They hate. And because Jane Addams was very early before the kind of global communications that we have today, she was able to go where few people had gone. She met with the high official people in Germany and Austria, in France. They, they fanned out these 16 women from, or more from the US and went to the different sides. They, they were actually of a stature that they could get entry to some of the, the officials, but they also interviewed women who'd lost a son or a daughter or a husband or, various people who lost people or whose family members were blinded by gas and they weren't so keen to fight. So she was countering this narrative that everybody on the other side just wants to keep fighting and they're, they're horrible people. So now we have, how did they keep people fired up as we were getting ready to go into the war and, and we did go into the war. Here are some of the um, images that made people want to fight. And a lot of them had to do with Kaiserville or raping in Belgium. So here you have Kaiser Bill eating up the whole of Europe. And you notice they give one arm and one is hidden. I wonder if that was a direct allusion to the fact that he had one withered arm that was shorter, but they're, they're not showing that other arm. Maybe it was a, a slam at him for having that disability, I don't know. And here we have the bestial Huns who have raped Belgium. And what are we going to do about it? And we're going to, we have other wars. We had the raping Serbs. We'll probably have the raping Russians soon. And I'm going to write a, an essay, like a rhetorical study of the use of rape in propaganda, the weaponizing of the accounts of rape survivors, survivors, because it is a powerful tool. And you can see it here on display with the naked woman at the bottom who's, who has been raped. And then there's the German view, and I'm not seeing the, oh, here it is. The German and French view of, from the Rhineland because the other side had its rape stories too. I think this one may be French and it's a little bit different, but it, it looks something like this. The German cartoons would be the, the very large black 
colonial country soldier and the very white woman with the, the mulatto baby. And they called them in German Rhineland bastards after World War I. And I think they may have called them the same thing in World War II, I don't know. But this is their view of um, not only rape, but racial insult to white women from people of color. And I think this is important to filter in that how does this motivate people to put up with the, the expense of war? And you can see here, you, you can, whatever your perspective is, you'll feel different emotions when you see this. This is very powerful rhetorically. And in addition to what was going on among the two sides, we have our, well, my old friend, you're just being introduced to him, Richard Harding Davis, who was the nemesis of Jane Addams. He was the person who lived only for war. He never saw a war that he didn't love. He was a Beau Brummel, a real fashion plate. You can see that in the picture. And he also influenced fashion. He, he became a model for some of the cartoonists of the day. But his, his invectives against Jane, Adam were, Jane Adams were terrific. He had no respect. He couldn't call her an anarchist or a Bolshevik. He would have liked to because she was too upper class and had never really exhibited any of that. But he used other, other epithets for her, um, silly, vain, impertinent old maid, things like that. And he inspired people to do much worse. Um, uh, feces was deposited and smeared on, on the doorstep at her women's peace party at least once. So what's interesting about Richard Harding Davis was he had a vast uh, influence in his day in war reporting. He was like the top war reporter going to Europe during the Spanish-American War was the first he, cared, he covered. And then he went to the Boer War and then he went to the First World War. Uh, he died, I think, in his 50s, so he didn't get into the Second World War. But amazingly, his fame completely disappeared. He vanished almost as soon as he died. He'd been a real fashion plate and a man about town that everyone wanted to be photographed with. But because I think of his personality, he was very self-involved. And there's a biography of him. I actually bought the biography called The Reporter Who Would Be King, a biography of Richard Harding Davis, which gives you, you have to look at both sides. I, I understood her side very well. So I, it's like a 400 page book about how, why he felt the way he did. And he built up Teddy Roosevelt. He, he had, Teddy Roosevelt owed his career to some of the buildup and PR that Richard Harding Davis did for him. So that's, that's the big nemesis, but there were many others. He was the leading one, the most famous one. Here's the Women's Peace Party. And that was held in January of 1915 before she went to The Hague. So this was sort of the, what, why are we doing this going to The Hague? Making, it was the communication of the day. They had to show up in person. And she explained the issues, which were not assigning who was at fault. And in fact, I think I have a little, I'll read this while you can look at what's on the screen, but no, this goes with the slightly later slide. So that's just that. And then I have another bit to read when we get to the right slide. So it turns out that the Netherlands, most people don't know who was neutral in World War I, was neutral. And because of that, Jane Addams and her group could get on a ship called, I'll give you the name and everything, was called the Nordam. And they were able to, to go through the submarine mined waters. And, and it was very dangerous. Ships were traveling in convoys because they were afraid of being um, torpedoed. So what happened? Huh. Well, why did that happen? I have no idea. Okay, well, moving right along here, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, here is the ship that they were on. It wasn't in the greatest of shape because it had already been torpedoed once and it had been fixed. So uh, then it was torpedoed in, 20, in 1917. So then it was uh, laid up for the rest of World War I. When they got there, or here's the last days on, on the ocean, 
And Alice Hamilton, who was the doctor at Hull House, was narrating. And you could just read it, uh, what she was saying about what they were seeing. And there's a lot more than this, but this was one of the more vivid passages. And then I have something, after you look at that a second, I will read about the day that they arrived. So I'll give you a couple seconds on that. All right, well, it was the sixth day of the second battle of Ypres, one of the world's most futile and costly engagements, which would end in a stalemate, leaving 122,000 dead and wounded men. On that day, April 28, 1915, a mere 104 miles north of the battlefield, at The Hague in neutral Netherlands, 1,136 peace-seeking women sat down together to discuss how to stop the carnage. They did not argue about the relative responsibilities of the, of the parties to the conflict. Indeed, they believed that everyone, no matter where they lived, must shoulder some of the blame. Their aim was rather to find a mechanism of mediation that could end the conflict there and then. In the longer term, they were determined to identify and to eradicate the causes of war. So some wanted to come and couldn't get there. Uh, the British delegation was held back and refused ferry service by Winston Churchill. And I, I talked to Kate and it, it could be that he didn't want them to go because it was bad publicity or he was afraid for them. He didn't want all these prominent women from very uh, well-placed families to all go down together. So we don't know why, but only three of the British delegation got there because they left early and 180 of them never got there. The Russian women may have wanted to come, but it was too much between them. So I thought I'd go into a few vignettes about who some of these women that are now lost to us. But if you, you can look them up in Wikipedia, as I say, hit print screen if you're interested in any, and you can look them up. So these this pair is, a, a, I, I guess it's not unfair to say they're well known as this. They're a lesbian couple who were very active in the peace movement in Germany. Dr. Anita Augsburg and Fräulein Lita Heyman. And both of them went on to a long career of working for peace and disarmament and other, other um, progressive causes. And they were not looked at too kindly <laughs> in their home country at that time, but I think later on they were accepted. The one who actually set the whole thing up was Aletta Jacobs. She was the lead, she was a leader of the Dutch delegation, and she was a first the first woman medical doctor in the Netherlands. She organized the whole con conference, although you know Jane Adams and the other delegates came, but this is the actual organizer. There were no French women because they just had the Battle of Ypres, Ypres however you pronounce it, Ypres, and the losses were huge. And so it, they couldn't even imagine going to anything that would stop them fighting to get something back that they felt they'd lost. Then we have Rosika Schwimmer, the Hungarian delegate, and she was extremely active. And she was very um, radical in terms of her, her pacifism and some of her social activism in terms of economic redistribution and things. She and Julia Grace Wales, who I'll show you, were some of the ones who proposed this continuous conference of neutrals and emphasized the importance of neutral countries. We're losing that, if you notice, currently. So this, they would be shaking their heads, really, seriously. Um, here's Canadian-born, and she was the Wisconsin delegate, Julia Grace Wales. And what they call her plan is the Wisconsin plan, although she was born in Canada. And she tried to get these points that some of the ones that you'll read about later. And well, Wilson did not adapt. Um, President Woodrow Wilson did not adopt some of them. And she just returned to her academic career after this conference as we entered the war. 
The Danish delegate was Thora Dalgard. And she started the Danish Women's Peace Chain, which became the Danish branch of WILP. And it still exists. And I saw some of them at the uh, Zoom meeting of the International Triennial Congress this morning. And she also organized assistance for Jewish children in Nazi-occupied Denmark, and I guess maybe adults too. So Crystal McMillan was stranded. <laughs> I think she, she managed to get across, even though she wasn't one of the early ones. And she was a terrific proponent of women's rights. And even Winston Churchill could not keep this woman, I'll tell you, back from that conference. And here she is. She was the uh, first female science graduate from the University of Edinburgh, as well as the first female honors graduate in mathematics. She, she was on many causes and the second word, woman to plead a case before the House of Lords. And again, she was one of the founders of Wilk. Here's our, I think this is our second to last one, the Belgian delegate. And having talked about poor little Belgium, a few of them did make it, despite the fact that Belgium was right in the middle of all the fighting. So here is Eugenie, I don't know if it's Hammer or Hamer. Here's the Austrian delegate, Leopoldine Kulka, who was from Vienna. And again, she was a suffragist and founded the peace groups in, in Vienna. So I think she's the, oh no, there's one more from Italy. She was one of the first to um, try to set up this conference and got all these signatures of support for the conference. Oh, there's more than I thought. Here's a Swedish one. And she actually helped to found Save the Children. I've heard of that. I guess it's the same organization. Oh, here's another one, Norway. I had more than I thought member of the Norwegian Women's Union. And again, a lot of these sort of duplicate. They're, they're all involved in, in various women's groups. And here's the final one, our fashion plate, Rosa Genoni. She, she was a fashion leader. You can see that in Italy. But she also was a very strong feminist and for workers' rights. So she saw how um, the sweatshops treated the women who were making all these beautiful clothes in Italy. But she was unable to become a big fashion leader during fascism. And here are the stats on who got there. You can see the vast majority came from the Netherlands. USA coming in second, German, Germany coming in third. And after that, it dwindles down. Here's an interesting little um, a piece that came out by Constance Drexel. It's very interesting because uh, there's a timeliness factor. And Constance Drexel wrote that her impression was that at this point in the war, the Germans were not even looking for peace, but they were happy to welcome this conference because they were fully confident that they were going to win the war and they had no objection to being seen as being for peace. So she, and she may be right because as it turned out, she was a big proponent of Hitler later on. She had a sort of neutral sounding name, but her real background was, was German. And she went all through the war praising all the arts and things that were going on that the Nazis were doing. And they even tried her at the end of World War I, I mean, World War II, but they said that all she did was report on women's issues and praise culture in Germany, but she didn't do enough to really uh, merit any kind of censure, so. All right, and in her text, Peace and Bread in Time of War, here's what Jane Addams says about this staying away from negotiations, because each side, she said, would always do that, and they were always hoping that the next week would be better. We're not gonna negotiate now when we get a few more miles of territory we're willing. Here's what Jane Addams answered that. She said, these small victories are like the superficial action of waves of the ocean, but at the bottom of the sea is the unbearable burden of war. And here's the unbearable burden of war. This is the timeline of what was happening in the weeks leading up to the, the conference. 
So we have the blockades coming in and the British attempting to starve the Germans into submission by blockading their port, ports. Neutral ships, ships heading for Germany having to be escorted and detained. And then the first steamship becomes uh, the first one before the Lusitania to be sunk by uh, German U-boats. And then the second battle of Vipa begins and Germany uses poison gas for the first time. So that's why the timing of this conference was very difficult because a lot of people were so angry that they had used this and so many people were blinded and killed in 10 minutes that it made, it, they started on the 28th of April, right after this. So you can see that that was a very difficult time to have this conference. The economic blocks, which I always study the politi political economy of war. The Berlin to Baghdad railway was not completed until much later, but this was a very contended thing in the Balkan countries around the time of World War I. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need a drink. The Orient Bahn was started by Austria as the Novi Pazar Bosnian Railway Project, and it recreated, uh, it created, not recreated, an acute rivalry over the Balkans and Mid East trade. And Germany was trying to persuade Turkey to come in uh, with all kinds of carrots and promises, and they were going to champion Constantinople against its religious rival Mecca and you know, make it more of a tourist and pilgrimage site. And that means a lot of money. And also to liberate the Muslims who were under British domination. So the result would be a world where Islamism and German empire would peaceably blend. And that was in the book, the Novi Pazar, I guess it is, railway project. So now we're getting into the, the Congress itself. The rules were, discussions of relative national responsibility and resolutions regarding how wars would be conducted are outside the scope. That's important because the Geneva conferences and other conferences that the, the official male conferences were deciding how the rules of war. But by contrast, the Women's Congress started with a protest and their protest included what they called outrages against women. And that was the only way you could say rape, and you, you couldn't actually use the word rape, but that was their first protest, and it didn't become a war crime until the 1990s. So as they moved into their second point, how do we get from there towards peace? They wanted people to not weaponize rape and the survivors, but to extend sympathy on all sides to all the women who are suffering rape, not just the women who are being raped by the other side. And so they, they also extended what we would call wiggle room because every contending warlike group say, says that their war is defensive. So if that being the case, then you each have no irreconcilable differences. You can start from that. You're not, you're not in an offensive war. They would take it that way and try to push it from that angle. The peace settlement continues that no territorial transfers without the consent of the people in it should happen. Autonomy and democratic parliament should be available to all. Arbitration, governments bring moral and economic pressure and the governments also should become more democratic. And of course, women should have equal political rights. Now, the fourth point is a real departure from all the male peace conferences because it was accepted up until World War I that you just stop talking until the war is over. So their point was we would have continuous mediation. The next point is principles of permanent peace respect for nationality, and this one is hard, and you can see how hard it is in today's world. No taking away territory. Well, it depends, you know, this is what was very difficult then and now. Arbitration and conciliation, that goes with continuous mediation. International pressure toward peace, not toward more arming, and you'd have to work on the media for that. Democratic control, including women 
on war issues. That was a big departure because think of what it was like in 1915. We didn't even have the vote yet in the United States. And women were considered okay to be working in charity. And when Jane, had, she wouldn't have called it charity, by the way, but when she worked at the settlement house, everyone loved her. When she tried to go out into the field of war and peace, everyone hated, not everyone, but people turned on her in droves because that's not a woman's area. And nine, the enfranchisement of women. And they had huge hopes for that, although we've seen it, was, it didn't come out the way that the women then thought it would be. The fourth point was international cooperation. They urged the third Hague Peace Conference, which they did have in 1919. They urged a Society of Nations organization be developed and a permanent Hague Court of Justice. These things all have happened in one form or another. So after uh, the 1915 Peace Conference, when Jane Addams had finished with her visits all around Europe with leaders and with the civilian populations, she went back and she had a couple conferences with Woodrow Wilson. And he agreed that they would like to have a concert of nations. And there were some points, which I'll show you, that, that were not addressed by Wilson, but other points that he took up that were influenced by this Congress. Here are some of the ones in highlight that were from the Congress, or they matched the Congress, whether he admitted that's where they're from or not, I don't know. Um, so you can see, I won't read them, you can see which they are. Others are more specific to different points of uh, contention in the war and how they would be parceled out. There's only one little mention of colonialism. You see that number five? And the whole rest of the world, all these huge colonial empires that had sent millions of troops for their colonial masters were not even considered. And the, the um, self-determination of nations was certainly not extended to the people who lived under colonial rule in that era. So if anyone wants to do a print screen, you can do that. And then you can print it out because it's a lot of text. And I'll just leave that for a second. Okay, moving on. So Woodrow Wilson's rhetoric and his mediation movement were influenced, and it's acknowledged that uh, Lillian Wald, who founded the Henry Street Settlement in New York, and Adams both used non-escalatory rhetoric, which were, were an important influence upon Woodrow Wilson and the mediation movement, this is called. And the rhetoric is so important, people don't realize that the type of choice of words and rhetoric can have such a huge impact on how things get escalated or not. So some final thoughts. Uh, women can be useful in peace issues. They don't have to stay in the kitchen. The positive role of non-escalatory rhetoric and the role of peacemaking from the margins. That's a real slogan within WILT coming from the margins, meaning the neutral countries or the people not directly involved in the dispute. So all of this pressure, join NATO, join NATO, that's completely not good. <laughs> the role of neutral countries in peace mediation and the role of continuous mediation, which is always in every war discouraged by warring sides. Um, I think that's it. And here is information if any of you found this interesting enough that you, you might want to get in touch with Wilf or be in any way involved with Wilf. Wilf has lost its Jane Addams original starting Chicago branch, you know, where Hull House actually is, is in Chicago. But we have uh, people with plans, these two women, just substitute the at symbol for the at. Um, they're trying to start the Chicago Wilf branch again, and we might have some events or meetings at Hull House. So with that, I would like to thank everyone very much, and I hope you enjoyed this tour back over 100 years now to what those women tried to do. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gloria. That was a huge amount of women's history and outstanding women from the world. Have you followed any of those particular women as to some of the things they went on to do?
you know that as you mentioned that I it's all a matter of how much time we have in a day but sir, yeah sure it, um, I'm motivated to look into several of them and just follow up and also that woman that became the Nazi <laughs> I, I found her ac by accident she was just a story I found and I thought oh I'll look her up she's probably some woman who worked with Jane Addams no she was you know went went whole hog for Hitler so I, I thought that's interesting. I would, and she's disappeared from history too. So these women are fantastic. There's all varieties. They they came from whatever belief system they had, and they, they were out there doing things. It, we always think it's we, you know, our generation and on that did anything. But I mean, we'd have a hard time keeping up with these women. The woman from Italy who seemed to be a fashion plate. She looked like her story would be intriguing. Mm -hmm. It's such a contrast that her ordinary life and her peace activity, activism, seems to be so different from each Don't other. Don't you think that's a hoot? I mean, she's there with all of her finery on, and it's uh, the rest of them were sort of like little... Um, Sparrows, you know, they tended to dress down the women that were very much for women's rights. Mm -hmm. Granted, she only had to travel from Italy to the Netherlands. That's true. <laughs> I'd like what to know who all those thousand women were from the Netherlands. They were huge, that bunch. Right. That, that was a good thing. And now, unfortunately, the Netherlands is no longer neutral, so they can't. Switzerland, I guess, still is. What does right. WILPF stand for? Okay, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, there was something else I was going to bring up. I can't think of it. But oh, are there any other you know questions? I see. Oh, I want to introduce a couple people in the audience. Shilpa Pande is one of those two names that I had at the end of people in Wilp who are trying to restart the Chicago branch. And she's here. So if you want to ask her anything about the Chicago branch that used to be in Chicago <laughs> of Wilp, <laughs> this is the original branch, you realize. This is like an apple without a core because the original one is the Chicago branch. And now Wilp is in 30 countries. It's huge. It is really a huge international organization but the original place where it started has no branch. So and I'm hopeful that we can, you know, do something about that. Do you know if they have any role in the Ukraine conflict? Well, they have put out statements on it. Okay. And in fact, I'm giving a talk because that's my area of expertise because of growing up in East Chicago and I've done a lot of work with Balkan um, reconciliation, peace and justice. Um, so at least I'm giving talks to Wilf about the uh, situation, especially the corruption in the government, both in Russia and in Ukraine. Because these things are very important, they tend to get shoved aside, just like the women and children get shoved aside. But issues of um, rule of law, um, corruption, embezzlement, graft, you know, the, they will say we're too busy now, but Billions of dollars are going to be pouring into that conflict, so we need to know. Right, and I, I'm looking at the chat, but I'm not seeing any new questions. Well, anybody? Any comments on women would working? You, would for... you be willing to share the slides with us? I'm sorry, which slides? You had this all the program. Your program. You had all those names and uh, mm -hmm. stuff. Um, if somebody like, wanted. To, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. If somebody would like to do a little more research on, because you had books and stuff, and I couldn't keep up with it, and I have an iPad, and this idiot doesn't know how to print it or save it or do whatever. Okay. Would you? Can you type your email address in, and I can add you to the people who can access the whole slideshow on Dropbox. And then okay, you can I can download. put that in the chat. Just put your, your yes. email address okay. in and you can 
access it. And I'll, I'll give you the link to access it. Or maybe Kate can send it to me. You probably have. Um, yeah, Gloria, I can send, have, I can send you Nancy's yeah, email. Nancy's, yeah, yeah, good, okay. Thank you, Kate, I appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank you for your interest. Well, I think you you tweaked me. I I was a was a history major in college, and our term that we used for the rape thing was pillage and plunder, pillage oh. and plunder, and oh. that was the phrase. That was a phrase that I was educated with. And and everybody knew what you meant, though, when you said yes, that. Yes, they yeah. did. Yes. I see. There's um, someone's asking about Shilpa. Is Shilpa still here? Shilpa, are you with us? Yeah. Yes, I'm with everybody here. <laughs> it took me a while to get off mute. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yes. someone is asking uh, I was about typing you. My correct email address. Very, in, are you reading it in the chat, Shilpa? She's giving yes, you yes. And I wanted okay. to correct the. I wanted to write the type the correct uh, email address. It's uh -oh. uh, it's not Shilpa dot It's actually email to Shilpa. Okay. So I will I will just write it down in the chat so everybody can uh, reach out to me. And first of all, thank you so much, Gloria for uh, <laughs> letting everybody know that we are, this is, this is what we are trying to do. And uh, all this wonderful information, just amazing. Well, thank just you. Amazing. That's, and that's I, and I think I really wanted to comment that uh, what really sets us, what is, what I really find special about this organization is the fact that it's international and the fact that it really connects women from the global north, the global south, east, west. I mean, look at me. I joined, I joined WILF in India in 2008, the Indian branch, I mean, the Indian section. And here I come and I'm able to join WILF oh. US. So it's, it's just amazing. It's, uh, and the history is just like so, so inspiring. <laughs> I don't know how those women traveled in ships. I can't I, I, imagine. My generation is lost. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking that we can be inspired to do something today and connect women and we can be powerful together when we're feeling helpless as individuals. That's what I felt, you know, preparing this today. I was walking around and around in the house to try to think through what I'm going to say. And that came to me that this is, we get so depressed because, you know, the news is just, oh, and the way that the way that the news is put together, it isn't like trying to aim at peace. It's, it's selling weapons. So, you know, we have to do what we can do. Well, I'll remind everyone that we're recording this, so you will be able to revisit the presentation and, you know, listen to it again. We should have it on the website within about a week. So I think that there was so much information and so many interesting women. I would be intrigued to see what else they did in their amazing lives. Well, maybe uh, Elaine, you might want to do your own, pro you know, a little program on that. <laughs> Something about these women for peace. Well, thank you. I see people saying things in chat and I, I thank all of you. I really think that um, any of you who wish can certainly get access to this. I'll put you on the people that can access the whole slideshow. I mean, the reason I'm doing it that way is it's huge. And, you know, it's seven. Meg so many. Yeah. Right. Right. Anyone that would like that, if you put your email in the chat, then Kate can share the link to the Dropbox. Sure. And you will have um, access. Either that or she may have to let me know and then copy me the emails and I can, because I think I, okay. I'm the one that controls. The right, event, right. So. Exactly. I, I'd let her do it, but I don't know if it allows me to let her do it. <laughs> right. And and Timothy, uh, I have typed my correct email address. This yeah. is Shilpa. Right. Well, yeah. this is, I see that you have um, a name that sounds like it may be Greek, Timothy. Yeah. Are you of Greek heritage? Absolutely. Are you, yes. Are you from Chicago? Yes. Okay. 
did your family ever work on these Hull House theatricals? Oh, no. no. Actually, no, I shouldn't say no, because my grandmother in the in the teens, in the 1910s, and you know, in the teens, mm -hmm. was very wealthy, uh -huh. but she also had a chauffeur. Oh. And, and her chauffeur would drive her around with baskets of food to leave with poor people. And um, she eventually uh, started in the, in the church that her family was part of. Um, the women's, they called it the women's club, Mm -hmm. But it, it really was a charitable organization. And mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there you are. You see, she was she was doing parallel things, whether with yeah. or without Jane Adams. Well, she didn't speak English. Well, there you are. Oh, in my <laughs> dissertation, by the way, one of my three immigrants wrote only in Greek. And I, I talked about how, well, anyway, if you want to know more about that woman, Theano Papazolu yeah. Vagaris, I'll tell you more about her. Just I'd put love to. Up. I'd love to. Put yeah. your email where I can get to it. I did. Oh, you did? Oh, oh, I didn't get it's it. It's in the chat. Oh. And I don't know how to save a chat, so oh. you probably do. Okay. Well, I will I will scroll back to it. But I have, excuse me, I see another question here. What did they do after they returned from the peace conference? Well, they faced hell. <laughs> That's what they did. And Jane Adams had a nervous breakdown, actually, but of some degree of one severe depression because everyone had turned on them they dropped their support you know that's a big deal for an operation like Hull House that has bricks and mortar and utility bills um, some of their biggest donors left because they didn't like that they were not all rah-rah at the time it was the thing to do was to be you know backing our boys and so she faced years of uh, vilification and uh, assassination of her character and and during that period, she had one very bad depressed period, but she bounced back. But I would say that's what they did. They had to just hold themselves together while all of this was the, the drumbeat of war. You, you can't imagine. I mean, it sounds bad today, but that was much more severe. And so just keeping themselves together and writing, I think Jane Addams did write. She had a nas national platform she could write, but not on peace. Once we were almost in the war, into the war, they wouldn't touch anything of her peace writing. So she managed to get the book, uh, Women at the Hague, out in 1916. And I think the one, Bread and Peace in Time of War, was around the same time. Maybe, maybe that was even after the war. I can't remember. I'd have to check the date on that. But they were both around the same time. So they had, a, they had one venue that was their writing because they had been speakers, but people were booing her off the stage and threatening her. So uh, that, that prior life that she had of being someone who could just go to big civic fora and speak, it was gone. And they just had to be in a much more, um, they, they focused even more so on the neighborhood and their local issues and helping building a kindergarten and a healthy cafe so people would have vegetables and things like that. I hope, does that answer what you were, Cynthia? Yes, thank you. I was looking for a more fuller picture, you mm -hmm. know, as, as you came. Uh, well, I came guess I didn't want to give you the bad news because it got very bad after this. Didn't get good for a long time. But then gradually in the 1920s, as people saw that it didn't really solve all these issues that the war was supposed to solve, they realized this wasn't it. and Maybe she wasn't wrong. And then gradually her reputation came back. And finally, by 1931, her reputation was very high because people realized that she, she had said this war isn't going to solve what you think it is going to solve. And that's when they gave her the Nobel Peace Prize. Took a long time, 15 years, 16 oh, yeah. years. And, and she really did. I, I, don't have an, I don't know if anybody's written in detail about her nervous breakdown she had. I, I take it as that. They said a severe depression where she had to go into retreat in the country. Well, I didn't even know that she had a nervous breakdown. So that's that's really good that you're sharing all this information there's only 
that much history that I know of. <laughs> it wasn't superhuman. And, and actually, I think Robin Lloyd was going to come. I don't know if she is here. Robin, are you here? Did she come? I don't know. But she's the grandchild of Henry Demarest Lloyd, who was a big backer. He had money and a big backer up in Winnetka of Jane Addams. But he too had her similar values and, and peace ideals. He had a severe bout of depression. I think that was not uncommon for people who tried to be for peace in that period when they were just vilified all the time. So in other words, if you're going to go with your idealism, be prepared for what may happen. It, it won't come without a cost. Oh, I see Diane. Hi, Diane. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I, my question kind of is not important now. I was just, I was thinking that after she won the Nobel Peace Prize, probably she was back to good graces with a lot of people. And you said that it, she, so that's, but I had raised my hand before that to say. Well, she only um, lived, she only lived four more years. And she, she was too sick at the time. I think she'd had a heart attack to go get it. So they had to read out the speech. For, somebody made a speech for her. But um, she knew she had gotten it and, and got the award. It was mailed to her and everything. But she, she had uh, breast cancer. And in those days, you know, they couldn't do what they do today. And then I think it was a heart attack. She had that in November when the Peace Prize was awarded. So she, she knew that she was back and that they recognized, that was lucky that she didn't die you know, a few years earlier. Right. But I really appreciate our, our shared name with this group, you know, that this is the Jane Addams branch of um, AAUW. And Kate has said to me, when she was looking for what to call this branch, they, it just came to her to call. You want to say anything about that, Kate? Why, why did you call your branch Jane Addams? You're muted, Kate. Well, I had a message come in from someone oh. who, who'd planned to attend but fell asleep. Oh, <laughs> she'd been busy. So, um, yeah, I was looking around for some powerful Illinois woman to name the branch after. So Jane Adams seemed a reasonable person. So that's what and I And you even have to. a doll of her. <laughs> yeah, I have a doll, yes, but I'm not going to show her today. All right, you don't have to show her. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, goodness, there's another message in chat from Timothea. Um, so... Maybe we could hear from, what what does Timothy is saying? Oh, do uh, you want me to say it? I'm sorry. There are yeah. several groups that are planning a, um, an event uh, on August six, which is the date of the first of the Hiroshima uh, nuclear bomb, and um, it, the event will be held in Evanston at Fountain Square, oh. which has been remodeled to honor the veterans of war. It never was a war memorial, I don't think. But it has now been reconfigured to be honoring and praising war, mm -hmm. which is not pleasant. We're gathering at, uh, I think, 11.30, and um, uh, there will be some speeches, uh, and then we're going to walk down to a, on the shore of Lake Michigan, there's a, a pond, a huge pond, and we will float, sure, uh, have a thousand paper cranes. Oh, I was wondering if you were going to say cranes. Wonderful. Yes. Last night, five of us took a couple hours to make 60. <laughs> Whoa. But uh, we're going to work on it. And um, we hope it'll be a beautiful event. If anybody is in the area of Chicago, north, south, east, west, um, please come. Uh, call, look up Chicago Area Peace Action. That's the organization that's really heading this up. Chicago oh, Area cool. Peace Action. Well, I have a film. I was watching a Japanese film, strangely enough. And uh, here's the title of it. And it's all about a peace professor and these students who were trying to 
um, combat, and that's the wrong word, to, to oppose the rise of the fascist militarists in the 30s. No. And what became of the young men, it's like two men and a young girl, the mm -hmm. professor's daughter. And what happened to them through the 30s, one of them becomes more radical. And then what happens to them through the whole war and at the end of the war. And it's it's called, it's Akira Kurosawa, a very famous Japanese oh. director. What's the name of the film? No Regrets for Our Youth. It's a beautiful film, really beautiful. Mm. It gives you an insight to what was it like to be in Kyoto at the university there and to be not for all this Tojo and the militarists. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's yeah. one of my favorite Japanese films, actually. He's an outstanding filmmaker. And for that alone, you might want to watch the movie. Oh, right. And the cinematography, everything is really tops, you know, from Kurosawa. So, oh, and one other thing, in case you didn't get the title, I can hold it up. This is that man, and this is that book. What is it? The reporter who, I, I, I came the in late. The reporter who would be king, Richard Harding Davis, the, the one who was the biggest opponent of Jane Addams. So, oh. you know, giving him his due, he believed in what he was doing. He was not a hypocrite. He believed in it. And uh, well, he certainly made a good living reporting on war. He did. He did that. And he was a total he was a total snob. It, I had this one quote. He said, <clears throat> oh, I can't believe this. He, he was so his class bias was so prominent. He said, well, of the soldiers who get blinded by mustard gas, of course, it must be worse for the officers who are blinded and they suffer more than the privates, he says, <laughs> because as a rule, he is more highly strung, more widely educated. He has seen more. His experience of the world is broader, and he has more to lose. Before the war, he may have been a lawyer, a doctor, a man of many affairs. For him, it is harder than, for example, the peasant to accept the future of unending darkness spent in plating straw or weaving rag carpets. So that's Richard Harding Davis. <laughs> Why would he be king? Oh, because of his in ambition. his own mind, in his yeah, his, his empire of himself. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> sort of a citizen cane of the re re reporting community, I guess. Oh, I would say worse than that. Yeah. Citizen Kane was more focused on yellow That's journalism. True. That's true. This he is, wasn't like a war hawk. Yeah, this is a real war mongering person who. In his own mind, he, he thought like the medieval times, that it was all chivalry and you're yeah. all to defend the right against the evil. Yeah. And Diane, you still have your hand up there. Did you have another question or anything? I'm so sorry I did not take it down. Oh, no, I just <laughs> thought maybe you had another. Well, sorry. I actually, I did have another question though. There was a picture that you had, and on the right of these women sitting at this table, there was this one with this big white hat. Was that the Italian lady you were talking about? Do you, do you know who the women were? But oh, you mean the, the lineup of the women? Yeah. yeah. I'd yeah. have to go back and look, but... Okay. No, the answer at the moment is no. Okay. okay. Oh, Joan. I'm writing to Joan. Oh, dear. So I put that Akira Kurosawa and it was only to Joe. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see. But I, but I changed it to be to everyone. I wrote it in. To oh, you wrote there. it out. Oh, okay. So I, yeah, everyone. I have but, to go back. You need to change your settings so that the next it. time you write, it'll go to everyone. <laughs> okay. I, I changed it now. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Uh well, thank you so much, Gloria. We're oh, always inundated with information. Well, I just, I love your group. You're just a good group. And even if you weren't called the Jane Adams group, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you have a very good evening. And, oh, I said thank you very much. Oh, what a thing. You don't want to say tank. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there. All righty. Well, we're running out of time, but we really appreciate all the information 
and we will post the recording. And for those of you who indicated you'd like the slides, we're going to facilitate that. And perhaps we'll have another program in the future by Gloria McMillan. Well, thank you. We very seem much. to have developed a following. Well, you, you do have a, we have this kind of rapport, but you have to show the Jane Addams doll next time, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> you let her have a, have a, a day off here. Oh, she's reaching for she something. She may get it. She may, she may bring her on stage. See, we have a Jane Addams doll. Our, our chair here of the, the group has one. There she is. There bring she it up is. closer. Oh, Jane herself. Kate, oh. why don't you say something? Yeah, if you so say that... something, then you get in the big square so we can see. Well, this this is a little Jane Adams doll. She has a hat. Well, she keeps going out of focus, and um, yeah. She still has her tag with a picture of Jane Addams on. And she has a book, too. I forget what Yeah, book she's it is. carrying a little book. And it says... Um, 20 years at Hull House? Yeah, 20 years at Hull House. And Gloria is quite taken with this doll. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> all I have is my... All I have is my see you later alligator. In a while, crocodile. So like, every, every, every time I see Gloria on doll uh, on Zoom, she asks to see the doll. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to get one myself, I guess, so that I can commune with her, have something oh, okay. physical there. But she thank has, you. She has an embroidered face. And She's adorable. She wears a black hat with. Mm -hmm. That's red, what she did. Red wear, roses yeah. on it. It's, it's very like her. It's it's a sort of navy navy suit with a long mm -hmm. skirt. Would that be called serge? What I don't know. I'm not. No, much I, no idea. Yeah. She's got anyway, black, black boots on. Being that as it may be. Yes. And <laughs> yes, Gloria's definitely obsessed. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. All right. Well. Have a good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you again. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah.